Thunder, 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 Thunder Geeks are live! Hello, Thundarians! You're listening to 102.7 FM, CILU, or around the world at luradio.ca. That was Ailstorm with Shipwrecked, and of course, I'm Andrew. Yar, me be Rob. <laughs> and I'm Megan. And we're your Thunder Geeks. Of course, you're joining us here on the day after the most holy day in our calendar, that's right, September 19th, Talk Like a Pirate Day. Uh, I, I didn't realize, it, it sneaks up on me every single year. I mean, it's one of those holidays that you don't anticipate, but when it happens, you have to enjoy it. Yar, you got scurvy for brains. Yeah, actually, I was at the uh, the music sale for uh, LU Radio all that happened on Saturday, and I did not realize until after it was finished that it was Talk Like a Pirate Day, or I would have bugged Jason all day with just, Yarry, laddie, where do you be wanting these speakers? I'm surprised. I didn't know. I mean, I wasn't anywhere near a computer, so that's probably why. But you know what? I'm hoping that Matt Ryan posted something on Twitter of him talking like um, Edward from Black Flag, Assassin's Creed Black Flag, because you may not know this, but Matt Ryan, our beloved John Constantine, is also Edward from Black Flag. Uh, uh, our is a... Uh, actually, no, I, I do love him too as Constantine, but <laughs> <laughs> well, when we're speaking of beloved Megan... <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's just mine. That's just no, mine. no worries. Now, that's the, one of the things is every time I want to work on Talk Like a Pirate Day just to see if I can... Well, see how long I can get away with it, but I never end up working. I always end up having the day off. Uh, it was actually kind of quiet on social media this year. I, I didn't really see anyone talking about Talk Like a Pirate Day. I'm, I'm a little sad. Is this the death of pirates? Have the ninjas won, Rob? Yar, the pirates will never win for as long as we have the internet. That's true. I think people would be a little weirded out if I was to talk like a pirate while working at an Indian restaurant. <laughs> I want to see what that would sound like. I want you to sell me the tikka masala as a pirate, Megan. No. Go. Sell, sell me that tikka masala. I'm Don't so you want bad. us to buy that tikka masala? We're all bad about talking like pirates. That's why it's so much fun. So you got you got to go, yar, and that's pretty much about it. Yar. I'd be a terrible pirate. I'm sorry. Go, go. No. Yar, buy this chicken masala. Yar, buy this chicken masala or I'll cut your belly. I don't know. Whatever. Close enough. That, that works. No, I'm happy with that. <laughs> with me hook hand. So, uh, <laughs> for those of you that don't know, we are, of course, your Thunder Geeks. Every uh, day, we, oh. Every, every day, year. every year, it's day. It's almost every year. I, I'm a little bit uh, time disoriented now after watching so much Doctor Who with you. So we'll get to that later in the show. <laughs> Doctor Who had its premiere. Rob's been adamant on getting me into Doctor Who. So my perception of space and time seems to be completely off. Of course, every week we get together. We like to talk about the nerd news, geeky stuff, and whatever we've been doing this week. So... Let's start off. Now, Megan, what have you been up to this week? Uh, I have I actually just finished a book. I, I actually got back into reading, and I finished a novel. Was it Go, Spot, Go? Because don't tell me how that ends. I'm still trying to finish that one. <laughs> it was Jack and Jill, by the way. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Jack and Jill ran up the wall. <laughs> ran up the wall? Is this Attack on Titans, uh, Jack and Jill? Because that'd be much cooler. <laughs> yes. Jack fell down his broken broke his crown and then got eaten. <laughs> Anyways, sorry. But yeah, okay. So this is this is a, a, um, from a series that I'm very familiar with actually. It's um, the seventh in a series of 23. What's the, what's the book series? Okay, so this is uh, Anita Blake and it's by Laurel K. Hamilton and uh, oh, I love this series. I was in high school and I was given a book by my teacher's aide and she's like, I'm not into this. You can have it, whatever. Turns out that, that Anita Blake is a necromancer. She raises the dead to help people uh, to help people solve cases. Like she does detective work with it. Um, she also helps people solve their wills, um, any kind of murders that were you know un unsolved. Mm -hmm. She raises them, gets the information that she needs, and then she uses it to you know for good. If I was murdered and brought back from the dead just to mess with people, I would say the butler did it. The Not butler. Did it. I, w I obviously wouldn't have a butler. But I would just like 
say the butler did it and then per even if i didn't re-drop dead i would just fake drop dead just to really mess with people i have to call shenanigans on that i think if you had the opportunity to have a butler you would have a butler. if i had the opportunity yes but i'm already dead in this case oh okay i'm just going to be <laughs> raised up and say the butler did it and die <laughs> again so anita does more than just raise the dead she also kills vampires so she's a vampire slayer so this is a cross between uh, how how I'm interpreting this so far is this is a cross between Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Murder She Wrote. <laughs> so I want to so I'm picturing Ang Angela Lansbury, you know, doing like flips and like sticking crosses into people. How close am I to the book series? Um, Anita Blake doesn't really do flips. She's she's more uh, she's she's very agile, but she's more like aggressive. She's more defensive. She uses guns and everything like that. But she also also has like weapons hidden in her clothing, so like knives and whatever else her her silver cross she always wears anita is uh actually she's a short busty woman with long brown curly hair i just love her anyways uh so this book is about how she is now dating the master vampire of the city she just got out of a relationship with a werewolf oh she, seriously she's so starting to no, sound like buffy don't <laughs> i was gonna say buffy okay <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the reason why she's not dating the werewolf anymore is because he... He gave her fleece. No, <laughs> he changed on top of her and she did not like that. She, it was... <laughs> oh, it's like wolf cop. <laughs> <laughs> and she saw him... <laughs> now, Rob, for those of you who haven't seen wolf cop yet, it's definitely one of those fun, over-the-top movies. We've talked about it a few times, but there's a special thing about its transformation series. You know, transformation thingy i'm losing the word for it but you have to see it to believe it and i have never seen that body part be the first part that transforms <laughs> i am glad i have now but that's now in my head canon why she would be so upset because there was a lot of blood well when uh when your when your boyfriend kind of just changes into a werewolf and then eats the guts of another man you know sometimes you just gotta break up with him that's kind of insensitive some people are into that megan <laughs> i'm just imagining ethan going after andrew and then you just saying off to the corner going, is this hot or not? <laughs> uh, what I love about this novel is uh, she's so... Uh, Laurel K. Hamilton is so good at describing people. Mm -hmm. When when she introduces a character, you instantly have this vision of what they look like. And it's it's instant. And you know what? She is so good at being like, okay, you like this person now. You like them. And then being like, oh, no, you don't like this person either. Like, you could you could, you could, could read an entire book about that person, but Anita Blake being like, I don't like this person, you, it would ruin that book for you. So, uh, you're seven books in now. So, what, is there, like, an ongoing story arc, or is it more self-contained, uh, like, episodes? And what is that ongoing story arc? Every, every book is a whodunit. So, Anita gets a call, or she gets a, some detective work, and uh, she has to figure out who is... So in this book, there's uh, someone, an arsonist. Mm -hmm. Someone's been setting fires in different cities, and one just hit in St. Louis. It was where... Firefly. <laughs> no, it was Hot Streak. Oh, yeah. It was that one guy <laughs> from Static Shock. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, that, isn't that Hot Streak? No, what was his name? Uh, I don't remember, but hot he was shot. hot. Hot Shot. He was yes. hot. He was hot. I see what you did there. <laughs> okay, so again, I'm going to add to my head headcanon here for this picture of this book. So it is Angela Lansbury <laughs> as a uh, tough but loving um, werewolf prejudiced uh, vampire hunter. And now she's fighting the guy from Static Shock. Okay, okay now continue. <laughs> Okay, so she has to find out who's been causing these arsons. And the funny thing is, is like, she usually by the mid of the, the mid section of the book, she's like, oh, here's who done it. And then she fights them to the death. This one, you didn't find out who was causing the arson until like the last five chapters. Oh, so it so it's good at crafting its mystery because that's one mm -hmm. thing that I have. It's always hard, tough, especially with mystery books or anything that has to deal with you know where you're trying to actively figure out the what what the cause was. Is a lot of books they make it too obvious or you figure it within the first three seconds. So she's been better at actually hiding at the oh. who done it aspect. Yeah, Lorella is very good at it. There was one book I was reading where it was like sh I can't remember what the what the goal of it was, but someone was someone was. Uh, I think it was raising dead without, with uh, and making feral. I have no idea. <laughs> feral ghouls. I think that's what it was. Anyways, 
turns it turned out to be a character that you would never expect and it was just like whoa it was pharrell it was pharrell ghouls it was just a typo <laughs> and the ghouls are there they're like why well, you get bugging us we're just happy mostly the ongoing story is uh anita is you know having this relationship with the the master of the city and uh, i i don't like him I, oh, so it's. I don't like Jean. They, oh, I don't oh. like Jean Claude. He's this French thousand-year-old vampire. What's wrong with Jean Claude? He could do a splits like no one's business. <laughs> yes. Okay, Jean Claude Van Damme. I love Jean Claude Van Damme. Well, now it's Jean Claude Van Damme. We're casting this movie, so <laughs> it's going to be Angela Lansbury in the lead role. I, I'm pretty sure. I, I I should actually check if she's still kicking. Is she still kicking? I think she's still kicking. I'm not sure because that would be a very different movie if she wasn't. I don't see her not still kicking. I'm just saying. But, uh, yeah, this book was so was so good. I don't know. It seemed there was so much action in, in it. It just it's it was almost stressful because there was so much going on. And uh, Anita is a human being. Anita is a human. She has magic in her. But she ends up actually being able to call um, the ghost of a, of a fallen werewolf pack member oh and it's so strange and it's just like whoa anita you're getting so powerful and it's only the seventh book i just imagine you holding the book going, <laughs> <laughs> yes there are moments like that where i'm just like so stressed out and oh i just i love this series so much please pick it up the first book is called guilty pleasures and just by the just by the name of the book, you're drawn into it. It's guilty pleasures. Yeah, oh. if you, if you, especially again, I'm guessing if you're more into the the occult, vampires, werewolves, mm-hmm. mm, and you don't want them to sparkle like Twilight, <laughs> is it Twilight esque? Do, do they have a lot of feelings? Okay, so there is a guy named Edward, and there are werewolves and there are vampires. Yes, but, but the, I mean, but so the difference un- is... Underworld have done has done this as well, and it's fun, fine when it's in Underworld. Yeah, but this is the difference is is Anita usually kills the heck out of these guys. Oh. The okay. Thing, thing is, you can have romance and vampires. I'm going to pull back to Buffy. Mm-hmm. Well, of course. Well, I mean, even going back to Le, Lestat and you know Anne Rice novels. Of course, you can. I mean, vampires and romance is something that's been you know synonymous synonymous for a very long time. Even going you know back to Dracula, where he was very well known for you know having the hypnotic eyes, where he would seduce women into becoming yeah. You know, well, he's good at that. Exactly. So, I mean, we, we can't hate on it just because there is romance in vampires. There just needs to also be, I think, bloodshed. I, well, there needs to be a sense of danger, I believe, from the vampires, or it kind of ruins the allure. Where it's if it's a safe vampire. It's it's not as much fun. Anita gets very overconfident in this novel because she's been ha- she's been having this power of being able to look into the vampires' eyes without being enchanted. Uh, but uh, she ends up find- finding someone who enchants her, and she's like, "Whoa, I need to take a step back." the the par- The people that she's going to meet are just going to be getting powerful and more powerful. So I'm so looking forward to the next book. Very important. Angela Lansbury is not dead. She's 89, so she's still going. So we're fine on that. So she can be cast in the lead role. Um, we might need to, you know, Jeff Bridges CGI the face a little bit there, but or we could just completely change the age because, uh, you know, or we could get her just to exercise and kick butt. Yes. So I want to see a <laughs> butt kicking Angela Lansbury. Yes. Yes. Let's do this. Now th- that reminds me because uh, this very very back end rumor but there was a book series that I loved growing up uh, it was called Animorphs I and don't think we've talked about this before <laughs> I know I know uh, we've talked about it a few times however there's been talk in the background here that they're starting to try to shop it around for a movie because they're digging in and I don't care if they're digging into the barrel and they'll probably ruin it and it'll be terrible if they actually manage to pull it off because uh, a lot of these you know young adult books are and like you know teen uh, books are being adapted now because of the Hunger Games and uh, it, it's it's nice to see more of them, and I'm hoping that's going to have the back door for my special one too. Well, I think it's all going to depend on how Goosebumps does in theaters. I think so. Well, Goosebumps has already been greenlit for a sequel, so they have to be confident in it. I, I'm I've seen the trailers. I am confident because, well, for first they're including my favorite Goosebumps character, Slappy. Yes. Well, that's one thing is with the trailers uh, that I've seen, um, they pull from a lot of the books, but it's a lot of the books I never read. So I'm going to be curious. Maybe they're just saving that for the movie um, because the ones that I, besides Slappy, would be things like The Mask and The Blob and that superhero dude. So I, I'm i seeing more of the generic ones, but it'll be interesting to see. I hope it's really good. I'm, 
I like Jack Black generally, but I'm not sure because we saw R.L. Stein back when they used to have the TV series. That is true, but R.L. Stein himself gave Jack Black the seal of approval. And uh, uh, maybe it's just because we have that image of R.L. Stein already. Kids, I maybe don't know him as well, at least, you know, visually. So. Yeah, if you never saw the show and only read the books, you don't know what the guy looks like. So, yeah, so I guess it works with it. So uh, th- 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 I'll have to get over my own preconceived notions. I'm not a big fan of Jack Black, to be honest. I mean, I, I do like him, but I'm not just, I don't love him. That's all right. We all have our different opinions on people and things. Of course. Uh, I've actually, I've been watching, well, it just recently wrapped. He was in an HBO show called The Brink, where... Uh, I've heard of it. I've, the name rings a bell. It, it's a pretty good show, and Jack Black turns out to be perfect for the role, and it's it's a semi-more serious role, because it is a more serious show. It essentially goes through the every level in preparing for war or being on the brink of war nuclear annihilation so you have the top diplomats and stuff and they're going back and forth and you're not just seeing what you think you would see you're seeing what you're pretty sure probably happens behind office where they're swearing at each other they're going (laughs) off the handle sometimes someone throws a punch then you have uh in the military you have these uh struggling pilots one's a drug dealer trying to support his kid so they're dealing with more serious issues and then you have Jack Black and Asif Manvi, who are working in the Pakistan embassy as a new dictator takes over and is threatening to nuke Israel. And he's so crazy, he doesn't realize that Pakistan he hates India and not Israel. So oh it, it, it has you know this level of over the top of absurdity, but still somehow grounded in realism where it's like... I believe that this is what the people are like when the cameras aren't rolling. So, And in that role, he was absolutely fantastic. People always underestimate Jack Black. He is a good dramatic performer. Look at King Kong. Well, you know what I really liked? I really like him in uh, Drunk History. He made a couple appearances in Drunk History. And I really liked him acting out the people talking. I I like Jack Black visually, Mm -hmm. but I don't like his voice. Maybe, I don't know. Not a Tenacious D fan? Okay, no, there's one song by Tenacious D that I do like, and I can't sing it or say it on the air because it's the one of all swears. Oh. <laughs> Something about karate. I, I, yeah, that one. <laughs> I don't know. I'm a big Tenacious D fan. I love the D. <laughs> well, well, Rob, what would you say would be your favorite Jack Black film? Favorite Jack Black film? Oh, easy peasy, School of Rock. That's for a lot of people. Um, why School of Rock? Because I hear so many people say that, and I liked that movie, but it never set me off like other people did. Here's the thing. First off, the music in it, top notch. Second, the kids actually learned to play the instruments and the song. I didn't know that, so the kids are actually playing everything. Yeah, in... they know how to play. They know how to sing. Nothing's lip synced or anything. I liked that. I liked that movie because of the the kids. I liked the character that they portrayed. Their character development. Yeah, like usually I'm not for kid actors, but these ones aren't bad. They're good. <laughs> that's good to see because yeah, that's always a risk with child actors within anything. Is sometimes you get ones that are absolutely amazing, and then you get ones where you're, you know they're reading cue cards off to the side, <laughs> and it's just and hi. Yeah, and it's just awkward Robotic. the entire time. Yeah, yeah, but it's like you can look up these kids with Jack Black did do live performances. Huh. You know what? I there was this there was a video game that uh, Jack Black starred in. He Brutal voiced, Legend. That's the one. Okay, I couldn't remember. And he, he made a he made a short appearance in Metalocalypse as that character as well. Oh, I've I didn't see that episode. I had no idea he had appeared in that. I don't remember. No, it wasn't an episode. It was more of a commercial or a, pro- oh. a promo. That's yeah. really cool. Yeah. Um, I remember him in Clone High telling people to smoke raisins. Yes. Oh, that was the musical episode. Yep. That was one of my favorite. Uh, I, I, I loved Brutal Legends uh, with that. It was a game that really snuck up on me because I bought it based solely on the name of Tim Schafer and uh, seeing Jack Black in the role seemed perfect. And I didn't know that it was more of an RT, well, kind of an RTS. Where it's, it, it seems like it's just a generic hack and slash at first and it's open world. But then you start getting into the battles and as it expands more and more on the battles, you start directing different uh, unit types. And by the time you're fully into the game, you realize, like, whoa, this was a surprise attack RTS on a console and it works really, really well. Which is surprising because even when they've designed RTSs for consoles, they've 
always kind of paled in comparison to the you know PC. Yeah, um, which one was a good one? Uh, Brothers in Arms, I think it was. That was an okay one. Mm-hmm. Uh, I tried to play uh, the Bureau. Oh, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> it was bad. Um, I, I think the only other, it, it was a middling success for RTS, would be, yeah, it was, oh, it was the Halo one. The one everyone forgets. The one that's out of canon because the, uh, the Flood show up way too early. Uh, no idea. But yeah. What I, like, Halo Wars. There we go. Like I said, my extensive knowledge of Halo <laughs> is red versus blue. See, the problem with um, the Brutal Legend is I, I was really excited for it, mm. and I played the demo, and then I don't know what happened after that. I just, I just, it fell off my radar. I can try to lend it to you sometime. It's a really, really fun game. PS3? Uh, just Xbox. Uh, I think I, I have like, two. Like Xbox 360? 360. Okay, so I might be able to, might be able to borrow it from you. Good, good. Excellent. I think the favorite thing he did for me was, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember the, uh, Tenacious D in the Pick of Destiny? No, no, no. Um, <laughs> I had it on the tip of my tongue. I had it in my head just a second plot. ago. It was... Uh... No, no, no. Kung Fu Panda. Kung Fu Panda. Because it's when he was doing his voice work. Um, I love him in a voice role because he ten- his voice is one of those unique voices where I know when he's doing a serious role, I think that's what throws a lot of people off. Like, a lot of people... There was a lot of people loved him in King Kong, and a lot of people were like just couldn't get past that. But for him in Kung Fu Panda, when it's just his voice on display, he's really, really good at emoting through his voice. Oh yeah, he like I said, he's a good actor. But sometimes when you're given a bad role, even a good actor can't save the part. That's true. I mean, Fantastic Four. Fantastic Four is a great example (laughs) of that, where you have decent actors in there, but since there's no direction and the writing seems to be absolutely terrible, you have people who you can tell are trying to act and they're trying to give the right tone. They just have no idea what that tone of the movie is. So you have three different people who would be giving a good performance, possibly if it was cohesive and the rest of the movie fit that tone. But since they're giving three different performances, you can't really place anything. It's like that's what happened to Scarlett Johansson in uh, the movie... Lucy? Lucy, yeah. Yeah. She was she's a great actress, but that role just wasn't she was told to act bland. Yeah, bland. Yeah, that and that that's one thing that's I it, call it prequelitis. Well, not even prequelitis. It's it's an issue oh, cuz Lucy was its standalone, wasn't it? Yeah, but I don't mean like prequel as in it's a prequel story. I mean the Star Wars prequels where you oh. have this colorful cast of actors who are great actors and then a bad director that doesn't actually give them you know direction or make anything interesting with like, their performance you had samuel L. jackson and you made him boring exactly that's not easy to do he did command quite a bit of of uh, attention when he was on the screen but that's because he's samuel L. jackson yeah but if you listen to his dialogue it's so dry and stilted yeah mesa windu in the clone wars cartoon uh, both of them actually is much more interesting than he is in the movies and that's solely the fault of George. You know what I like though about cartoons is that you can you can express a lot more that you can in a in a length of a cartoon series than you can in one short mo- in a, in well I'd not that Star Wars is short but you know what I'm saying? Well yeah, well you you can decompress everything with things like the Clone Wars so you can go into developing the side characters and not just the main plot. But the thing is you don't even have to like decomp uh, have a source material to go from like all you need is one episode to explain characters, character development, and emotion. Like the Steven Universe we just watched. Yeah, no, that was absolutely amazing. We'll talk We'll talk more about Steven a little bit later in the show. I think we'll head to our first break here, folks, though. Of course, you're listening to Thunder Geeks on 102.7 FM, CILU, or around the world at luradio.ca. We're your Thunder Geeks, and we'll be right back. And we're back to CILU 102.7 or around the world at luradio.ca. That was a double shot with... No, no, it's not. Ninja Sex Party. Who are they together? Starbomb. Yes, Starbomb. With I Choose You to Die and Chameleon Circuit with Regenerate Me. And we, of course, are your Thunder Geeks. Thank you so much for tuning in. So before we go into one of the big things this week that happened with Doctor Who premiering, let's talk about some of the stuff that's going to be happening here in Thunder Bay. So... Our wedding. (laughs) 
Not yet. We, we still need our few requirements to be filled. But we at least thought of the cake topper during the break. Yes, because uh, this is an ongoing topic for those of you who are new to the show. Me and Rob are continuously planning our future wedding because it'll get to that point. We just need rather Neil Patrick Harris or Kevin Smith to marry us and then we are going to do it. And so we just decided on our uh, wedding cake topper of Cookie Cat and Cat Bug. Yes, I get to be Cookie Cat. And I'm Cat Bug. Because I'm really, really yummy. And you left your family behind. I did leave my family behind. <laughs> but some of the things happening here in Thunder Bay. So one of the big things is on October 4th, there's going to be the cosplay picnic happening at the Friendship Gardens. And then on uh, sept- uh, October 24th at... LU, they're going to be having a gaming expo where they're going to be running a bunch of tournaments. They're going to be running, uh, I believe it's the uh, RTS Club, the uh, League of Legends Club, and the Smash Bros. Club are getting together and they're putting on this gaming uh, event where you get to go compete, play with friends, and have tons of fun. I went to their last one. There was, uh, I think, about 250 plus people there. Tons of fun. And then, uh, of course, ThunderCon, where we're going to be there, too, on October 25th. Well, me and Rob are going to be doing our Bad Movies panel, and we just uh, we spoke with Jess. We're going to be doing a live show there as well that'll go to air the next week. So we'll get a, after this crazy, crazy October, we'll have a, a week off, and we'll be able to live tweet our show there. I thought you were forgetting to mention the most important thing coming up in October. <laughs> the most important thing. In fact, Thunder Geeks, we're coming up on our one-year anniversary, so our 52nd show is going to be on October 11th. We're going to be doing some giveaways on then, so make sure to tune in 1030 on Sunday. Sundays, as always, to Thunder Geeks, and we're going to do our big anniversary show. I'm excited for Halloween, too, guys. Me, I'm too. I'm so excited. Uh, okay. Do, do you have your Halloween costume planned yet? Um, No. I no. was I was hoping to be the Riddler, actually. Um, I have the cane. I just need the costume. Well, then let's go to the Halloween place that just opened by Burger King. Oh, I get a discount. Spirit Halloween. Also, if you go there and you say ThunderCon sent you... You get a 20% off on your highest um, priced item. Nice. Yeah. I always like discounts. I'm going to remember that because I get my discount plus that discount, 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 discount. I have a dress actually that I bought there. Well, my sister bought it for me. Thank her. She's the best. Um, it's I'm going to be wearing it for ThunderCon. So if you want to see Megan in a dress, that's a very rare thing. Yeah. It really is. I, don't, th- I can't remember. I yeah. don't think I have. No, because I don't think you wore one to the Donkey Kong prom either, did you? No, no, no you didn't. I wore a skirt, but I was not in dress. Yeah, I, I think I, we've seen me in a dress more than Megan <laughs> so <here>. far. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen me in a dress more than I've seen her in a dress. Oh, that's going to be exciting. <sighs> yeah, we. him and I have worn dresses more than you. <laughs> well, I don't know. You guys have the legs for the dresses, though. <laughs> Let's yeah, be honest. Yeah. My, my fuzzy, fuzzy legs. <laughs> Ah, I'm just smooth white chocolate. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, how about, how but about, Jack's white that, chocolate. That's Jack's white chocolate. That's what was in my head. How about yourselves? Have you planned out any Halloween costumes? Uh, I wanted to do Star uh, from Star vs. the Forces of Evil. I'm going to see if I can pull that together because it's always difficult with... And uh, as I've learned, I'm not the only one who always does cosplays within like the last two weeks or mostly delegates it to, to the people with skills there. Well, the thing is, is like her costume is like a couple of pieces put together. It's still doable. Yeah, there, there's. I'm sure you could just go to Valley Village and find a pair of devil horns like like two seconds oh yeah now rob i know you've been working on your costume is so is it just for halloween or i'm gonna wear it on so many different occasions it's gonna be my sith costume because i got a lightsaber so why not oh yeah i know and that thing looks compl- really really awesome are you gonna add a cross saber to it you should add a cross saber to it why aren't you one of the cool kids rob I... you should add a like f- you should add like a bunch of sabers to it i don't think those attachments are available yet oh soon yeah, I just want to extend the blade because I, I like it long. You need to help me make my Sith costume, too, for the for the premiere of, of Star Wars. Well, here's the thing for me and my tradition of costume making. I wing it. I have no idea what I'm doing. You you guys saw how over like comedically long the sleeves are right now. It just makes you look more ominous where you're just like, where are my arms? I have lots of lightsabers hidden up here. <laughs> yeah, I don't measure. There's a trick my mom taught me to sewing outfits where she just calls it the cheating method. What you do is just flip. Let's say you want to make a shirt. 
flip your shirt inside out and copy that. Well, that that works. That actually really does work. I just made the rope comedically oversized because it's easier to shrink down than it is expand material. I'm sorry. I didn't see if you had a hood on it or not. Not yet. I am adding one. Okay. I just not there yet. You can't have <laughs> you can't have the intimidating Sith look without a hood. Don't worry. It's like just a vest and sleeves right now. And, and the, the red streak will work too because the red streak will peek out from under the hood. So that'll look really cool when you get it going. Oh, yeah. I find it funny how when it's a brown robe and like the Jedi, when the when the hood is up, it's like this cozy, comfy look, like mysterious. And then when it's a Sith, it's like, oh no, run! Yeah, exactly. And it's it's that's it's, one thing that Star Wars used a lot was just uh, simple color motifs and even just the way the battles went. Uh, I forget which side was which, but uh, uh, it was normally good guys go right to left, but in uh. Attack the clones, they go left to right as a foreshadowing of the stormtroopers going, turning to the dark side. Yeah, if you actually go back to the, the battles in Star Wars, uh, the, the good guys and the bad guys will always, uh, when you're seeing those side shots, travel in the same directions as one of those just underlying motifs. Star Wars was great with using, uh, and that was one thing that was unfortunate with the prequel trilogies, is, is they, they used a lot of tricks where it'll register in your brain, but you will not notice it unless you specifically look for it. There's there's the more obvious stuff like color coding the different uh, blasters and but uh, yeah no it, it's really it's really cool I guess that's that's why kids love it so much because they can identify as that's the bad guy that's the good guy there's no there's no like you know super mysterious way of saying that's the good guy and that's the bad guy and I'll quote Plankett it's uh, you might not have noticed it but, but your, your brain, brain did. did. <laughs> <laughs> Now, so Rob, I know you've been itching to talk about this, and your your ongoing goal has been to make me love Doctor Who, and we are still searching for that, so we got to watch a couple episodes together with the new Doctor. Now, uh, before we talk about the premiere, let's talk about a couple of the episodes we watched here. All right, so I start you off with Deep Breath, which is the introduction of Peter Capaldi's Doctor. Now, why, that, that's why you started, was just so I could get introduced to the character. Yes, because that's literally the first time you meet the 12th. And as I understand it, because I know the Doctor always has a companion, this was the same companion the previous Doctor had. Yes. Okay. Uh, Clara Os Osmond Ald Oswald was the previous companion for Matt Smith's Doctor, and she was there when he regenerated. And, well, as you see in the episode, she's kind of had the fan reaction that a lot of people had online to Capaldi's announcement as the Doctor. Yeah, you, you were explaining that to me that they were also because I mean in the episode they were making jokes about please don't tell me I'm old and I, I like that little touch they had there where they're they can speak directly to the audience of trust us let us show us you know let let us show you what we can do with this new person here so for me uh it's entertaining ish so far um part of the issue I always have with a lot of Doctor Who stuff is. Especially when you get into the episodes that really rely on knowing the lore and knowing the past characters and events and such. Really lore-heavy episodes, and those are the ones that I find that are Whovian's favorite episodes, go completely over my head. Because I'm like, I know I should care about some of these characters, but since they these ones are already established, they're not developed for new people like me. Which they shouldn't be, because it's for the fans. But that ends up making it go over my head. But there was still one character you liked, the crazy little potato man. Yes, yes. What was his name? He was Strax. Strax. He was probably my favorite part of the episode, and I would love to see more of him because he was he was such a difference in the tone, but he was very, very fun to watch and fun to see acting. Uh, well, what the fans have been petitioning for for a while is we want a show based on the trio you saw in that first episode. Uh uh, Vash, Jenny, and Strax doing pretty much like crime solving in Victorian London with the alien twist. That would be kind of fun. Uh, that might be something I could get into, uh, especially not only because it's like easier to get into, because that's not the first thing they've spun off of Doctor Who as well. Uh, oh god, so many. Uh, we got the Sarah Jane Adventures, uh, Canine, Torchwood. Oh wow, I just knew about Torchwood. I didn't know there was other ones. Yeah. What are the other ones? Uh, the Sarah Jane Adventures are pretty much a family show uh, based on one of the former companions, Sarah Jane Smith. Okay. She was the companion of the third and fourth Doctor, so going way back. And when she came back to David Tennant's run in the new series, mm -hmm. fans went nuts. It's like, holy... Because she's still got the part. She still enjoys it. Mm -hmm. And after like that being one of the top-rate episodes of the time, they're like, 
Let's give her a spin-off and see what we could do. Sadly, the actress who played Sarah Jane passed away before the show finished. Oh, that's unfortunate. But it was one of those, like, it's the show itself is such a legacy. And then we had The Adventures of Canine, which is... Uh, is it about a dog? Yes. Please tell me it's about a dog. Is it a time-traveling dog? It's a time-traveling robot dog. I'm... I why Okay, why didn't we start with this one? If you wanted me to have an intro to Doctor Who, you just say, I have a time-traveling robot dog show, and I'd be completely on board. <laughs> Tell me more, sir. Uh, K-9 was the fourth Doctor's assistant, a robot dog from the 52nd century. Oh, so we're going back old here. Yep. Is it in color? Of course. Oh, okay, I don't know uh, when they switched to color. Okay, <laughs> everything past the third Doctor's in color. Okay. So, uh, actually... K-9 was reintroduced with Sarah Jane because when she came back to Doctor Who, she's like, hey, look what I kept all these years. K-9. Oh, that's... And again, it's a nifty thing for the fans that when they see that, I mean, I know I would fangasm if I was, like, immersed in that universe. But since I don't know it... it just... you, you will soon. Uh, I, by be... any means necessary. I'll, I'll just clockwork orange you. I think that's pretty much the plan at this point. I'm not sure what it is with British shows, because there's some that I can really get into, and other ones where there's things I like about it, but, with, and that's the thing with Doctor Who so far, when I'm watching individual episodes that really just stand on their own, I don't need to know anything else, I just need to understand time traveling, shenanigans, go, and the Christmas episodes tend to work great for that as yeah. well. Uh, I also showed you the time heist. Yes. Which was time traveling and the only way I, de I described it to you was Ocean's Eleven meets Doctor Who. That was probably my favorite of the episodes you showed me because that one, it, it very much did stand on its own. And the idea of time travel and a heist movie, well, heist episode, uh, was intriguing. And it was fun to actually watch that mystery unravel. Because they start off the episode with their minds wiped. They don't know why they're there. All they know is they have to rob the most impenetrable bank in the universe. Yes. And as the audience, we also don't know. It just kind of drops us in. And it was a yeah, and like I didn't see the twist coming at the end. Um, the actress they had for the villain in that episode was absolutely amazing and it, very Do intimidating. <laughs> Doctor Who does villainesses very well. And uh, we watched the the Christmas episode yeah, as last well. Last Christmas, where it's aliens meets Santa Claus meets Doctor Who. <laughs> yes, um, I think the previous Christmas episode you showed me, I like that one a lot more. Oh, yeah. That one was still with Matt Smith. This one, I kind of enjoyed it, but I was still more ambivalent to it. That line of "You have a horror movie named Aliens," I find that very offensive, <laughs> and that makes sense. I mean, if we're gonna get invaded for any reason, it's just because it's gonna, you know, aliens will show up, and it's just gonna be. It's going to be look like like black faces from like the 1930s where they're going to show up and they're like, this is terrible. We don't show up and blow people up. It'll be even worse if they actually do look like the aliens, but not as extreme. Like they have big eyes, but not that big of eyes. They have greenish skin, but not that green of skin. So we've uh, unintentionally made a character of the aliens that they find horribly offensive. <laughs> and that's the reason Earth is invaded and that we all get destroyed. And we need to check our privilege. We need to check our privilege. <laughs> yeah, St St South Park also <laughs> premiered, so we'll talk about that later in the show here. That's I want to see that alien invasion movies. I want to see the PC aliens invade. <laughs> Let's pitch that to Eli Roth. <laughs> oh my gosh, but that's then, so bad. Yeah, now since I've gotten you somewhat into it, I still think if I start you off on Matt Smith alone, because the thing is with Matt Smith's introductory episode, it's standalone. You don't need to know David Tennant's or Chris Freckleston's era, because... Mm -hmm. Smartly enough, they had a brand new team, and they're like, you know what? Let's just start from square one. So, uh, that that might be the best approach, because I think that's where I've seen the most episodes so far, and a lot of those were just standalone time-traveling time episodes. And if you want to go back to the old ones, go for it. I've seen a few older ones. I'm, I'm not sure from which Doctors, just because it would be random episodes played yeah. by friends, but... Which episode did you show me? It was like the void child or the empty, the empty child. The empty child. That's what yeah. was that about? It's um, World War Two. A little boy with a gas mask running around. Going That's around. not spooky. I'm terrified already. Yep. Are you Children my should mommy? not have gas masks. Are you masks. my mummy? Are you my mummy? And if you touch him, you become empty like him. Oh, you showed me that episode too. That one was horrifying. Yep. It was creepy, but like I just I don't know. It was, I couldn't get into it. I hate British children in horror <laughs> films. They are terrifying to well, me. Well, Stephen Moffat, the guy who's currently running Doctor Who, like he I said, has a goal of making everything scary. He made statues scary. He made Wi-Fi scary. 
Uh, how did you feel about the Red Queen in uh, Resident Evil? Mm-mm. You're all going to die down here. No, no, no. Uh, that, that's maybe that's why I have an issue getting into a lot of British shows where they have a British person as the hero. I'm so used to seeing British people as the <laughs> villain that I'm like, wait, wait, wait. I'm waiting for the secret devil reveal where they're all turned out to be <laughs> evil. They did. They did invade. You know, most of the uh, most of the Earth. I'm just oh, saying. The, well, yeah. They, they, the the giant empire. <laughs> well, then you got Missy in the new series. Oh, she is terrifying. And but fun. You can't deny the fun. I won't go into spoilers, but I am very disappointed. It, but I, 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 I'm, I know that we can... You can say who Missy is. That's not a yes. spoiler. Yes. Missy is the female version of the Master. And I have no idea who the Master is, so explain that to me. Uh, what? The Master is uh, pretty much the Moriarty to the Doctor's Sherlock. And is the longest running villain next to the Daleks of the Master. So what's her origin? Uh, her origin is she looked... When a Time Lord comes of age, they look into the Untampered Schism, which is a hole in time. Okay. And you'll either be inspired to do great things or be driven to madness and run away. This sounds like a terrible plan. Well, th- the thing is, when that happens, the doctor... You have a 50-50 shot here. It's like, okay, rather, you're going to do amazing things, or you might become completely evil. Let's see what happens. Well, here's the thing, though. The doctor walks that fine line because he actually got terrified by what he saw and ran away. Oh. That's why he's, he's never stationary. He's always going, going, going. Oh, that makes sense. So, oh, well, the show sure showed me. Yeah, and <laughs> the master actually didn't see anything he just heard a sound just the tapping of a drum just one two three four just oh and that and that's all he kept hearing in his head for the rest of his life is that drum beat oh yeah that'd be like torture and it drove him mad that makes sense uh so uh when did uh the master become missy because i i know that she she gener- regenerated brand new uh with uh Capaldi's run. Oh, okay. Uh, when you in, uh, get introduced to her in the um, Deep Breath episode, which you saw, mm-hmm. you don't know that's the Master. Oh. Not until the very end of the season do they uh, say, she's like, oh, you know who I am? I'm Missy. And who's Missy? Well, I can't call myself the Master. <laughs> that's cool. And it's cool to also see them put a female in that role, because uh, from the episodes I've seen with her in them, she completely steals the show. Yeah. She is very... Yeah, and it's... It's a test run because the writers do want to have a female doctor because it is possible to regenerate different genders. That'd be kind of cool because there are a ton of female Doctor Who fans. Most of the Whovians I know are actually girls. Yeah, but they didn't want to like go straight off the bat just in case it could like have negative results. Yeah. So they're like, okay, let's turn the master into a woman and just see how people react. T- test the waters. And people love Missy. She's so deliciously evil. And she's so proper and posh about it, but then just snaps and goes cuckoo. Like, where she just kills two guys because Clara said she might be good. (laughs) (laughs) So tell me more about the new Doctor here, Capaldi. So is this his first season, or how many seasons has Uh, he been running? This is season two for him, uh, season nine in general. Or season, like, 50-something by now, if you... Because everything in Doctor Who is canon. Yes. So I'm going to say, like, season (laughs) 50-something. It's hard to keep track. Uh, but yeah, this is his second year as the Doctor. What makes him different? So I know he's older as well, but what what makes him unique from the other Doctors? That's one thing you explained to me, that every Doctor has a very unique take on things, a very unique personality, and he's always changing. Uh, there's actually a great analogy that was given. Uh, Christopher Eccleston the Ninth is the Tiger. Mm-hmm. David Tennant's the Tigger. Matt Smith is the uncoordinated house cat that trips and pretends it meant to do that. Mm-hmm. And... Capaldi's grumpy cat. <laughs> so maybe Megan would like Capaldi. I, you know what? There was when when there was that uproar about him being the new Doctor, being like, oh no, he's old. I was just like, y'all just hating because you can't lust after him because you don't think he's sexy because he's old. Yeah, and that that's weird because if you look at the lineage of Doctor Who, yeah, they've most... all been like m- mo- you know young to middle aged attractive males. No, they it? really haven't. Most of them have been like. 50, 60 plus. Yeah, no, most of them have actually been older. That, that's well, why I was confused. I'm like, I, the, the doctors that I really know other than Matt Smith tend to be older dudes. But so. recently, though? Yeah, but the Matt thing Smith. is... Yeah, but Matt Smith is literally the youngest. No one's... 
Yeah. I'm confused now because I I've every every image of the doctor that I've seen, they've all been like middle aged or younger and like no, uh, first we got strapping the, young lads. First we got the first, which is uh, William Hartnell, who was in his late sixties, early seventies. Yeah. I don't know. I just I, I I saw so many people being upset. You, you're looking at age. Tumblr. I know. So all the pictures you're seeing are all the hot doctors, or they're just <laughs> making them hotter. Yeah. So they're like, okay, now now the first doctor he has awesome pecs and a, this chin. <laughs> yeah. So doctor, the doctor has been generally an older gentleman. Yeah. I am thoroughly misled, and yeah. I need to brush up on my Doctor Who. Now. Well, that, that's something that happens when you have a lot of new people enter a fandom, and they it it's a double-edged much... sword, where it's great to have a lot of new people into it, but then when that's their first impression for them, that's the standard. So when it leaves that standard, even if it's calling back to something older, a lot of people will get upset. It's something we see in comic books all the time yeah. where they'll do a change. A lot of people get a, you know introduced to that you know, new standard. And when they do something different with those same characters, people get upset. Even if they haven't been, you know, they, or even if they've only been into it for a short time or if they, even if they just know it tangentially. You always have a lot of bandwagoners because that yeah. happened a lot. But for the most part, people have accepted Capaldi and they're really enjoying his run. Fun little fact. Do you remember the movie uh, World War Z? Yes, unfortunately. I try to repress that. But... No, but there's a little tidbit. Um, during that movie's premiere, mm -hmm. there was the announcement that Matt Smith is leaving and someone's taking over the role of Doctor Who. And uh, Peter Capaldi played a doctor at the World Health Organization, or has his movie credit is listed, WHO Doctor. That was oh. the, the... They actually wrote that in as an Easter egg. It's like, he is the doctor, but you don't know it yet. That is really cool. I love when companies do really subtle viral marketing, especially when it isn't caught until afterwards. That's actually one thing that uh, James Gunn recently said about Guardians of the Galaxy. There was an Easter egg and a big one that he thinks no one has found yet. And he didn't tell us what it was, unfortunately. And I haven't heard anything new come out. So I think people are still searching. But there's still something left to be found in that movie. Exactly. And that's that's Doctor Who in a nutshell. That Now we're going to be going to the new series, Season 9, that just premiered. So what we'll do is we'll talk about the premiere itself after our break here. Of course, folks, you're listening to 102.7 FM, CILU, or around the world at luradio.ca. We're your Thunder Geeks, and we'll be right back. And we're back. You're listening to 102.7 FM CILU or around the world at luradio.ca. We're your Thunder Geeks, and that was Voltaire with It's Bigger on the Inside. Cause... And name drop. Oh, I walked into that. No. For I'm the... surprised. I'm surprised you didn't name drop when, when we were talking earlier about Doctor Who because haven't you met most Matt of Smith, them? Matt but Smith, but I haven't met Peter Capaldi. However, we still got through it. For those of you who haven't listened before, every episode we try to go the episode without talking about someone Rob has met. Because Rob has met every celebrity on the planet uh, at this point. And this is the one I kissed. And this is the one he kissed. And this was my suggestion for the show, and I didn't think about it. And, oh, <laughs> you had this plan, sir. <laughs> you are a deviant and a good one. Yep. So, we've been talking about Doctor Who, so let's talk about the premiere here, because I have a lot of questions. Uh, it was very heavy in lore. Oh, I, yeah. saw, I noticed you going off the charts here, so what happened? Okay, so we opened the episode with a boy in a war field, pretty much surrounded by weird hand things that'll drag you beneath the surface if you move. This was some of the most metal imagery I had ever seen. Just this <laughs> little, small, scared British boy in a bunch of zombie hands with eyes, right, like, just bursting out of the ground so and at first it's like oh this is this is an okay setup no this was a horrifying setup for doctor who it's an okay setup and then the boy said his name and andrew could you describe my face they said davros and rob lit up like a christmas tree just going no way and just... so uh, who's davros davros is the creator of the daleks which i am sure you've I, seen i know who the daleks are the daleks you so beautifully put are space nazis yes they are the space <laughs> nazis with uh, the plungers on top of what appears to be movable porta potties yes so that that that's and uh they are very scary i am told well um, the thing is it's like here's a race of aliens who believes you should die because you're genetically inferior they believe everything that isn't dalek is genetically inferior 
and deserves death. Well, ha- have they have they been pretty successful? So are they in uh, superior, Rob? No, no. Why? Because the doctor always wins. Oh. But yeah, they pretty much wiped out his entire race. And if the Daleks are space Nazis, Dalros would be space Hitler. Oh, so yeah, because he created them. Little space Hitler. I'm I'm okay. There was little space Hitler in a field of hands. That's and, kind of awesome. And the thing is, uh, the doctor before the boy said his name said, "I'll save you. Don't worry." What's your name? And when he says name Davros, you see it in the doctor's face. It's like, Uh-oh. oh. This is pretty much the guy who created the race that wiped out my people. I have a chance to walk away to do the wrong thing for the right reasons. And uh, I, I noticed they also had, um, it was one of the scenes in there, and I needed you to explain this to me, where they had one of the older doctors, it was in black and white, and he made a reference. So what? explain that to me. Uh, in one of the best story arcs, Genesis of the Daleks, the doctor is given the mission by the Time Lord High Council. And this was one of the previous doctors. Which doctor was fourth. this? The fourth. So, this so is it's going way back. Way back. And the fourth doctor is given the mission to go back to the dawn of the Daleks mm-hmm. and wipe them out before they ever became a threat. And he pretty much has this setup where all he has to do is touch two wire heads together and it'll wipe out all the Daleks from history. They'll never be a thing. And he pauses and goes, do I have the right? If you had a gun pointed at a young dictator's head before he does anything wrong, do you have the right to pull the trigger? And pretty much now, it's evolved into the point where it's like, I know how evil this dictator is. I have to pull the trigger. And that's, it's a very distinct evolution of not just uh, like, well, showing the other side of the question there in Doctor Who, but as a society in 2015, it's, that's something we see now, you know, the preemptive strike, quote unquote. So this, I guess, this is them taking the other side there as well. We do know what happened. So even though they're not guilty yet, they know, are the most genocidal race in the galaxy. If we know how much destruction they're going to cause, and it, it's an interesting to see the other side of that coin. And I'm going to see. I think I'll follow you on the least. I'll try to keep following here and asking you a ton of questions for season nine here. So. Uh, yeah, no, it's it's really interesting to see where it's really going here. Now, do you think he's going to do it, or...? I honestly don't think he will, but not because he doesn't want to, mm-hmm. because something will happen to stop the doctor, like a third party going, don't cross this road, I'll cross it for you. Like, maybe Clara will take up a gun and shoot Davros, because... If the Doctor takes that step, it's one he can't step back from. Oh, this is more like Batman. So if you shoot... So yeah, like Batman is... It's crossing that line is too easy. So that's why I don't do it. Because that's what separates me from them. Yeah, and it's the same with the Doctor. Because he's the Doctor. He's not the murderer. Oh. So, uh... I'm curious now what your thoughts are as a, a Whovian. How excited... Uh, I, I don't think I have to ask you. Explain at least to the audience... How did you feel about the premiere? Here's the thing. Um, you saw Deep Breath with me. That premiere wasn't that great. It wasn't like... Really? Because you were going nuts no, during this it. This one was. But oh. like I showed you Deep Breath, which was the previous oh, oh, premiere. Oh, the previous premiere. And it wasn't the greatest season opener. This one, the moment that kid said Davros, like I was on my the edge of my seat. I'm like, where are they going? What are they doing? My favorite moment had to be, hands down, is watching Peter Capaldi on top of a tank in, I believe, Viking Ages, playing an electric guitar. Because he challenged the guy to an axe battle. Yes. Now, that is something I can get behind. If we can have that every episode, let's, can we replace the TARDIS with a flying tank that's powered by the power of music? The, I, I love the tank joke he made, too, because he got the tank for his fish. What? It's a fish tank. Oh. But is there an wah, actual wah. fish? Wouldn't surprise me if if the doctor opened up the tank and it's like, yeah, this is my fish. His name is Joe. So when does the next episode air? Is this going to be uh, weekly? Weekly. Uh, okay. The reason uh, Stephen Moffat said is it's taking longer between seasons is because he doesn't want a mid-season hiatus. That's nice. I've been very angry at hiatuses lately because a lot of the shows that I've been watching have been going on completely random hiatuses. Yeah. And I've uh, rumors are now swirling that Cartoon Network is putting a whole bunch of shows except Steven Universe on hiatus. 
And yeah, so yeah. Stephen Moffat straight up said, it's like, I'm going to take a few more months of filming so we can just have all the episodes one a week. That's nice to see because it's, it's easier to watch a show when you have that sense of continuity and then you can always go back to it. But I hate having the reruns in the middle of the episodes. I just want to see the full story arc. Exactly. And that's one of the things I love about this season so far is he said no hiatus episode after episode. Now, uh, let's talk about some of the other stuff that premiered as well that we promised earlier in the show there. Uh, So, South Park or Steven Universe, which one should we tackle first? I say let's start with South Park. Oh, (laughs) okay. Now, so South Park, uh, a lot of people have fallen out of South Park. And if you have, this would be definitely an episode to jump back in. Um, With South Park, despite a lot of people falling off, they've continued every season to have at least a handful of episodes that really hit and... Last season, they tried a new idea where they had an ongoing story arc throughout the entire season. So I'm curious if they're going to continue that again with this season, if they're going to keep having those story arcs build and build, because they acknowledged everything that happened from last season and more, creating a continuity that the show had had only more loosely before. But uh, (laughs) that's not what we're here. to. That's not what we're here to talk about. South Park came out swinging because so much has happened in their hiatus. So they're taking on Deflategate. They're taking on Jared Fogle, Cosby, and uh, something that's really risen in 2015, and that's political correctness. There is uh, a renewed sense of a more militant political correctness or demand for it that we haven't really seen since the 90s, since the days of standards and practices where, you know, no guns in cartoons because, you know, children will automatically want to shoot them, but lasers are okay because lasers aren't real, and you would have these really strict and elaborate and really over-the-top language police. And that's what South Park has tackled with this one, but they do it in the most interesting way. They take the extremes we see on Twitter and Tumblr and put it into a voice we all hate, the dude bro. PC I'm bros. I'm, P- I'm principal PC, and there's some stuff I'm really sick and tired of, bro. So, guys, what did you think about the episode? I I liked it um, because I had I've never met a super PC dude bro, and uh, you know taking that voice and putting it into that kind of body is is like it's really it's like whoa, that's what they that's what like people who are really really like over the top yeah and it's, it's like it's like you're being ridiculous it, it goes to a point of it, it's more of you're using bullying of other people to then bully yourself where you're banded with a whole bunch of people who may have a great intent but the the actions carried out tend to be more brutal more sh- and they they're at the same time shaming people who shame and it's it becomes more hypocritical and it becomes so loud and it creatively restrictive i know like there's been a lot of creators out there that are saying where it's we have to ignore the reaction of the internet because they can never be happy no matter what we do we're going to have someone who's angry about every single aspect of it and south park what well, they're great at cutting through everything and saying <laughs> okay that's the game you want to play let's see how far we can push it and one of the interesting arcs we have here is you have uh cartman capitulate where he's like it's over i'm i'm on their side now yeah, it's kind of interesting to see him defeated because no matter what he tries, the guy just doesn't back down and even gets more aggressive and vicious. Uh, ever since he had Scott Tennerman eat his parents, we haven't <laughs> seen you know, Cartman really back down, or at least for more than an episode. And I'm gonna, it's going to be curious if they start to continue that throughout the series here with, uh, with another story arc. You know, I, I, I can't imagine Cartman being a submissive person. I don't think I they're going to make him submissive. I think they're going to make him so PC, it's obnoxious. They're going to go the other direction where he's always been so offensive that he's obnoxious. But we, we know that person now, and we already look at that person with disdain. It's just sort of go, okay, and we, we, we've heard that before. You know. Oh, yeah. Edgelord, you can go over here and... But now, if he takes that other persona, uh, it'll be interesting to see what kind of commentary they can do now with it. <laughs> I loved... 
I loved Randy sitting at the table with the really bad hangover and explaining what he's all about, you know, in such coherence. <laughs> I swear they just took uh, like quotes from Twitter and then put it into the dialogue <laughs> of, uh, of of the PC bros. They they turned the PC bros into a frat house. So they're, they're spoofing essentially all of the previous hiatus here, and it was so much fun to see. If you've fallen out of it, I definitely recommend paying, you know, starting again with this episode because I think it actually has something important to say. Yeah. There. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just laughing. Megan's broken. <laughs> well, it's a good thing to be broken on because, yeah, it's hilarious. So let, let's talk about the other big thing that's uh, premiered recently. Uh, Steven Universe has been back for a couple episodes, yes! and we were going to wait to talk about it more because uh, we talk about Steven a lot. But wow, I am so happy with the most recent episode. And usually I don't like Sadie episodes. This one was Sadie's song. But the thing is about this Sadie episode is that there's no Lars. Yes, exactly. That's what I was just about to say because I love Sadie and I hate Lars. But the thing is, is... Unfortunately, Sadie is a is a coworker. Know, yeah. Not only that, but I do think it's good to have a show with a character we're not supposed to like. Because if everyone in Steven Universe would be so likable, that would I think take away something from it. As long as there's that character, it's like we don't like you. Well, even then, um, even the characters we do like, everyone has a flaw, and yeah. oh. it's it, I like that this show explores those flaws, not only of its main characters but of its side characters as well. And that's something that's been happening a lot with season two. Here is we've been introduced to more of Beach City and more of the families of the main characters that you you, you don't usually see in this sort of detail in uh, cartoons. It was great to see Connie's mom in the previous episode and her reaction to everything. Yeah, and you see, and that, that's something that's been an ongoing theme. I think the past two episodes i think uh it'll be interesting to see if they uh, continue that with the next couple episodes of just being a more of a family arc um because with connie's mom you see she cares so much about her daughter that she ends up not listening and that was the sort of the same theme here with sadie's mom but it was shown in a different light uh, i wonder uh, i wonder if they're gonna do a, like a bunch of mom episodes and then have steven you know kind of miss his mom and wonder more about oh. Rose and stuff. Like, I wonder I, if they're going to go, like, on a mom route here I, for a I little hope, bit. I definitely hope this leads up into... Yeah, that would, that's a great idea, and I hope that's where it <laughs> lines up, is that we get more into Rose. Uh, Rose is Steven's mom, who uh, had to give up her corporeal form to give birth to Steven. So we've only really learned from her uh, of her from brief flashbacks and filling in a lot of details with rampant speculation. Uh, I guess we should start with the first episode. Uh, Nightmare, Nightmare Hospital. Hospital. Jinx! <laughs> uh, spoilers ahead, guys. If you haven't watched um, the the first episode, the first two episodes of the new season, please watch them. Uh, ah, let's get into <laughs> it. If you're not following Steven, you ain't nothing. Steven's like Nerf. Nerf is like... You're a <laughs> So with Nightmare Hospital, uh, it, it, it dives more into... Uh, Connie's story with her becoming a sword fighter and Steven lends her his mom's sword and then Connie's mom freaks out when finding it and ends up, you know, confiscating it and taking it to the hospital <laughs> where they're hiding uh, gem fragments. This one had a lot of, like, subtle callbacks to different horror genres and even uh, it had quite a few uh, Easter eggs in there. In one of the pictures in the background, they actually had Dipper Pine's pine tree inside of the picture. Oh, I didn't notice that. Yeah, it, it was a really cool uh, sort of crossover that they did. And especially since, you know, they're on different networks. So, you know, it's just the animators just giving a shout out to each other. Okay, so there is this one little line that Connie's mom says. She's like, do you know how many children I treat with sliced off ears from having from playing with swords? None, because their mothers care about them very much. <laughs> yeah, and it was fun to see her reaction because <laughs> it's very understandable and stuff. Um which is hilarious because I remember being a young boy buying a sword and my mom's like, yeah, all right, just don't bring it to school. <laughs> <coughs> um, the, well, the first episode, I enjoyed it, but uh, no music, so I kind of was... Mm. But it did have one of the funniest Connie moments, in my opinion, uh, where it's kind of like, you didn't even notice my glasses for the past year. And she's mom's like, what's wrong with your glasses? No lenses. What, your eyes just magically healed? Yes! <laughs> Th that just that yes there was a joke in, that that steven made in that first episode that i'm ah uh, i'm missing it now i just, uh, no i lost worries. it they fizzled i'm sorry uh then we have sadie's song here that's the one that uh uh came on recently now with sadie's song we have 
The focus on Sadie here. Stephen walks in on her in the grocery store and finds her singing, realizes that she can sing, and Stephen takes over as he tends to do and says, oh, we're going to get you on stage. We're going to show everyone. He wants to support her and love her and not really listening, which is where we have our dual theme here with Sadie's mom. Uh, would you want to talk a little bit about Sadie's mom? Uh, Sadie's mom is... Uh, we've we've met her in a previous episode. She brings Stephen mail. Yeah, she's the replacement mailman, <laughs> mail person. <laughs> oh, I knew you delivered mail, but I didn't know you delivered Sadie. Sadie. <laughs> I yeah, that that was the most subtle and clever pregnancy joke I was never expecting, but happy to have. But you know what I love? Stephen's only seven, and he and he knows he knows. Does he know that well, context? <laughs> well, that's a good question because we don't really know how Stevens are made yet. <laughs> Anyways, uh, Sadie's mom is is very overbearing, and she's she just kind of like pushes things on her daughter. You know, we've we've all experienced that where you know you 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 look at interest in something, and then your parents are just like, "Oh, you like that? Well, here's stuff of that. You just take it." They're so desperate to get you into something that they overbear on you and throw everything at the child, and that's something a lot of kids have to deal with. I, I like she takes over, and I've had this problem with my mom, so I kind of connected with Sadie. Oh, I would try to learn how to cook, and my mom would be like, "No, you got to do it this way." And I threatened my mom with a knife. I was like, "Get away! <laughs> let, let me." cut this lettuce and then she was like okay okay one day and she was like let it do it and we're like I'm cleaning my room she would just be like okay i'm gonna help you sort through your clothes and then she would just end up doing it for me so yeah it gets frustrating like that and yeah. it, it's I, that's one thing i've loved about steven is they tackle a lot of issues character types that we've seen before They're, these are people we know but we don't often see on television and we don't really see them especially all in one show it's a very simple episode where it's you know steven and sadie's mom pair up and they completely give Sadie a complete makeover, give her a choreographed dance, and you see Sadie uh, become terrified at the end because she's like, this isn't me and this isn't what I wanted to do. I just wanted to so sing a simple song and, you know, wear comfortable clothes and... Just be myself. Be myself. And Steven realizes, like, oh, you know, this isn't for you. This is me. And we have an amazing moment. And I think there's actually a, a very poignant point behind this. Steven Universe has been getting a lot of criticism about being so friendly to LGBT for, uh, themes. People who are, you know, still back in the Stone Age and don't, uh, you know, and they, uh, this comes off as just essentially a, a direct response saying, we are going to do whatever we want and when you know we're not going to capitulate to people criticizing over things we think you know don't matter anymore so if we're gonna have steven go up on stage in drag and sing a song about being famous and coming out of a pink limousine we're gonna do it and it's gonna be amazing and, and it was it was absolutely awesome and the animation they uh they had for that scene was fantastic because they are just mugging all over and they are living for that moment i'm sorry but steven is seven okay what seven-year-old boy didn't raid his sister's closet it once and wear a pair of high heels and a dress and sing and spice girls even if it was just to make fun of his sister so rob did you do that yeah same <laughs> <laughs> exactly and that's actually a great point that uh yeah when i was uh i think i was around seven when the spice girls were you know becoming huge and of course i was a you know a young boy with an older sister so i love the spice girls oh and god yes <laughs> And that's what I think we can do a forced positive review on, because I know you want to do that Spice World. I will hold that is an amazing oh. movie. <laughs> oh, I remember, like, all the people in my class being like, oh, yeah, they're lesbians. They sleep in the same bed. And I'm like, they're not lesbians. And I was like, I should know. I, I love how thing, like the culture has begun to evolve then, where that's instead of... That's one thing I have to give uh, about the younger generation who cares so much, but maybe... A little too much? Maybe. Well, not even a little too much. Um, Choose your battles. Lacks the patience or overreacts. Is Their reaction now isn't, let's bully the teen who is different. Let's protect them with all cost and bully the bullier, which unfortunately creates new bullies, but... I, I, I it's think progress. it's uh, a great thing where that was analyzed is people get offended for other people who aren't offended. Yes. But like, 
sorry, I like that we're in this new age where it's not, oh, they're lesbians. It's more of, oh, they're lesbians? That's yeah, so good Steven for them. Yeah, Steven Universe is being celebrated for showing off, you know, LGBT characters, not only within uh, Garnet, but even with, you know, Steven playing with, uh, playing with, you know, just cross-dressing and having fun on stage because he wants to sing a song. I also love how the show does, in a way, celebrate different body types. That as well, and that's something that it, they work it into the character types. Yeah, like, if you look at Steven, he's a chubby little dude, but he's so happy and cheerful that you really... You root for him. Yeah. And, yeah, and that, that's what had me hooked into the very first episode with Steven himself. He is such a shining beacon of happiness, and you show that he does understand a lot of what's going on. He Maybe not all of it, but he recognizes the problems, you know, the his caregivers are having, and he knows he not only has to be strong for them, so they can be strong for him. What I like about Steven Universe is that uh, it shows a different, a different family dynamic. So I think we'll leave the show on that, and uh, of course... Well, if you want to continue the conversation online, you can go do so on our Thunder... Uh, ah! Words are falling out here. Blah, 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 dot com. Take two. <laughs> if you want to continue the conversation online, you can do so on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash thundergeekspeak. Want to follow us on our other social media? You can follow us at Thundergeeks on Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr. Want to send us some email, a fan mail, or even a song suggestion like our last song here? You can do so at our email or on our Facebook page. Thundergeeks at luradio.ca. So our last song here is actually one that was sent in by a listener. It was... R Let me bring up his name here. I just had it. It was Robin... De Prophetess. Uh, this is actually a Canadian song by the F-Holes, and they did a... <laughs> <laughs> the F-Hole is actually a portion on the uh, violin. Uh, it's the hole. It's an F-Hole. Yeah, I know what it is, but just to hear the word out loud is so funny. Yeah, they did a cover of the Mario 2 theme, so that's going to be our final song here. Now, if you want to tune in next week, Sundays, as always, at 10.30 p.m., we're your Thunder Geeks. We'll see you next week. <laughs>